Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. My name is Angela, and I'd like to welcome you to today's session, Fighting Fraud and Boosting Data Quality in Research, with speakers from associations from all over the world. Before we start, a couple of points. The webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be made available to you after the webinar. You can ask questions during and at the end of the session by sending them through the questions widget. Our webinar platform has a few functions, which I'm just quickly going to walk you through. This slide shows where you can send your questions, see the slides, and a group of widgets. These widgets offer you the chance to interact with your fellow webinar attendees through the group chat, or to interact with the platform and with the content. The console can be adjusted with the windows made larger or smaller, so just click on the icons and see what happens. We've designed the platform for you to get everything out of our time together, so just experiment and have a little bit of fun. So without further ado, let me hand you over to our speakers. Welcome to this insightful webinar, Joining Forces to Fight Fraud and Boost Data Quality. I'm Gabby Kusters, Head of Global Marketing for SMR. We've got a diverse lineup today with perspectives that offer real value. We'll be hearing from prominent associations that are shaping the industry, including the Canadian Research Insights Council, SMR, Insights Association, the Market Research Society, the Research Society, SimpleCon, and the Association of Market Research Austria. Our agenda is packed with valuable presentations. But before we jump into the ex exciting content, let's introduce a key player, Melanie Courtright, Chief Executive Officer at Insights Association, who will guide us through the current situation. As we delve into these discussions, I encourage you all to engage and ask questions in the chat, as well as we will have Q&A session afterwards. Now, without further ado, Melanie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to introduce you, if you haven't already heard a lot about the Global Data Quality Initiative and joining forces as a body of global associations to help in the fight against fraud and help improve trust in the data that our profession generates. So I thought I'd start by just giving you a little bit about the quality landscape. As you know, one of our key responsibilities as association leaders is to listen to you, our members, and learn about what's going on in the profession, identify threats and opportunities, and make sure that we're well positioned for the future. So that's what each of us does every day. And as we were listening over the last year or so, we began to sense a, a shift in the current environment around the state of quality and data quality specifically. Quality concerns are on the upswing. Um, the ecosystem is really quite complicated, and so there was a, a struggle to really understand where the data quality issues were originating and who was responsible for them. Some pretty inconsistent messages for people about what should be done and how it should be done and who's responsible and what sort of the core drivers of data quality issues are. There's even some alarmist language out there because of the way we've been using language inconsistently. Um, a real issue for our profession over time has been there's not a real quality buying signal. Some would call it a bit of a lemon market. You don't fully understand if you've bought quality until you've driven the car for a few days. Um, and then there's this competition over clarity, um, wanting to own a quality definition and a quality vernacular that ends up being different by, by um, company and by uh, agency and by provider that results in a lack of clarity for decision makers and for the people who are buying. Again, an issue with not necessarily a data-driven discussion, how much really is fraud, how much really is um, cleaning, and how much is inattentiveness. And as a result of all that inconsistency and lack of clarity, a blame game developing, who's responsible? Is it pricing? Is it that they won't pay for more? Is it that, the, that there's a real issue with fraud? Is it that it's the instrument itself? Is it a product life cycle of people getting used to taking surveys and wanting us to improve our survey experience? And all of that leading to a, an erosion of trust and confidence. So as we're listening, this is certainly something that global associations need to be concerned about and need to be helping address and shape the future. 
So we began to discuss that we need a total quality framework, a framework that governs how we talk about quality, the language, the language we use. What does fraud mean? What is fraud specifically? Are we using fraud as a broad term? What are we measuring? And what should we be sharing as a profession at large, as providers of sample and with clients? Um, everything from the percent of fraud to survey scores. And then we also need a framework around the data itself, thinking about participant fraud versus participant engagement versus participant experience issues and cre creating tools and techniques and language that allow us to better define the issue. It's a big thing to attack. It's a big issue to address. And so we quickly realized that we must collaborate. There's too much work to be done for any one association to take it on and make the kind of rapid progress that we need. So quickly, SMR and the Market Research Society and Insights and CRIC and and SampleCon and VMO, we all came together and said we should be addressing this together. Uh, an exciting global partnership to help move us forward. So with that, each of these associations has their own work stream so that we can make progress quickly in a number of areas. CRIC is working on sample frame and consistency while SMR is on the participant experience. Insights Association working on the language of quality, for example. MRS on fraud and bots, and you can see more here. SampleCon looking at sampling technology codes and some benchmarks. The Research Society, the use, language, and definitions of incentives. VMO looking at data fraud and bot technology in partnership with EMRS. And there's a new one here which will give you um, a bit of a teaser on with QRCA joining us. You'll begin to see more of them on our websites and in our language because they want to work on the qualitative research elements along with the Market Research Society. So eight now global associations, and I'm sure more to come in the future, coming together to address the problem as a group. With that, we're going to begin to give you some updates from each of these associations, and I hand it off to John. Thanks so much, Melanie. Um, so again, my name is John Tabone, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Canadian Research Insight Council, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our contribution to the Global Data Quality Initiative. Um, so the thing that we've been hearing a lot is that people are not really too sure about sample. There's a lot of the end clients and buyers of research have been kind of looking at sample as sample and not really looking at the differences in sample or inconsistency within sample. So the goal of our online research committee was really to try to inform those um, buyers and end users and really raise awareness of um, sample in research design. Um, there's been a lot of talk about fraud, but there's many other contributors to do data quality as well. Um, so in terms of what our guide is looking at is reviewing different sources of sample to make sure there's a better understanding there, um, explaining the relationship between sample provider, agencies, and end clients, and as I mentioned in the beginning, really a focus on transparency and sample frame consistency. Um, you know, we hear from many end users that they're changing sample providers and not really looking at whether there could be some differences there that could be impacting data quality. Um, we are also going to talk a little bit about the role about participant engagement um, and the role the end client, in fact, has in on data quality. Because we hear a lot about fraud, but no, I think there, there needs to be some emphasis on that. And certainly SMR is going into much more detail, but we do want to raise that um, as one of the things that they should be thinking about. Um, obviously, fraud is a contributor and we need to manage that and as well as in attentive respondents. Um, so that is something else that we'll be talking at a high level about. And then really our goal is just to get people thinking about um, sample in a different way, um, as to, uh, rather than just sample a sample, but a really understanding understanding sample, and then linking to other GDQ uh, resources to explore um, those data quality issues in much more detail. Um, I just want to briefly mention our online research committee, which is chaired by Greg Matheson at Quest Mindshare. I won't go through everyone on the committee, but um, thanks to their support for um, overseeing and developing um, this particular online uh, toolkit. Um, so now I'm going to turn things over to Joaquim and Judith from SMR to talk about their contribution. Thank you, John. I'm happy to present together with Judith the part of SMR, which is the part, as you mentioned, regarding the respondent. Uh, fraud is a clear threat to our industry, as it has been to the ATEC one. And in many occasions, I've warned about not following the steps of the ATEC industry, as this, it's fraud was already well quantified, and the level of targeting accuracy has been proven massively poor. Today, brands are already leaving the obsession on performance marketing behind 
and focusing themselves on brand building. Today, the most relevant brands work in the mid-long-term brand construction. In our, in our industry, we are still in the efficiency obsession. The strong message and that clients and clients are sending of faster, cheaper, and in-source is pushing the whole ecosystem to look for efficiency. Our insights world today is pipeline, as it is the ad tech industry, or at least we're following this pattern. Today, from any location in the world, a company can get 1,000 interviews of five minutes from 100 countries in less than 24 hours. So it's technically, technically possible, which is good. But working on efficiency can for, make us forget on the side of the raw material, which is the respondents' uh, data, the respondents' input. As we're working on efficiency, we must keep an eye firm on the panelist respondent, which in the end will elevate the quality of our raw material, which are the responses from people. So in that, in that work stream, SMR is working on two main pillars. One is supporting this effective discussion about whether sample is fit for purpose, and the other one is reducing the participant friction on how to improve survey participants' experience and enhance data quality. On the first one, uh, how uh, creating this discussion about whether sample is fit for purpose, we are building on previous work of SOMAR. When the online industry came into, into place, SOMAR worked on the standardization with the SOMAR 24 questions. Today we have built on that and we, have, we are offering these 37 questions, which is an industry framework for end users, for buyers, to assess the quality of the sample they are buying. It covers and it's adapted to the language that previously my Melanie was mentioning and this instant association terminology. It will be an extremely useful, it is already an extremely useful tool to discuss uh, users and buyers on what is the, com the composition of the sample and the quality. And as you can see, all these sections that include the, from company profile to the way the sample is sourced, the recruitment, the project management, data quality validation, and all those uh, compliance policies. This is already a reality. You can find these SMR 37 questions on the SMR webpage as well as in the global data quality uh, website that will be shown in the, in the end of this presentation. And I really, I really encourage you to work and promote this uh, way of talking and, and, and getting into the understanding of your supplier, what your supplier is offering, and as well for suppliers. I mean, it is the way that you can showcase how good you are collecting data and presenting that to, to end users. So when we talk about fraud, fraud is, a, fraud is a very big, very big word. I think we need to contextualize uh, this concept, and this is what I am encouraging yeah, uh, now Judith, Judith to present. So my dear Judith, uh, chair of the Professional Standards Committee, the committee that is responsible for setting these standards and guarding the code of conduct and who has led this initiative from this on our side. So, Judith, please. Thank you very much, Jürgen. So, I'd like to come back to the point that Melanie made um, about the issues around the uh, vocabulary, nuance, how we're talking about these problems, and um, the point that without a common vocabulary and a common understanding of the problems that we're facing in order to uh, make sure that confidence in the sample is at, at its highest, is absolutely essential. So claims about high levels of fraud without being able to distinguish between what is genuinely fraud, fraudulent behavior and what are those issues that are created because the way that the research industry is sometimes participating with uh, or posing to respondents doesn't do anything to, to solve these problems and it doesn't help to engender the level of trust that we need as an industry to, to have in research sample. So it's really the participant perspective that SMR has been working on um, in its new work stream to support this uh, very important GDQ initiative. So um, where we started was actually on a, a very good piece of work that's been done by the Insights Association, which is about a glossary um, which describes participant behaviours and we can see eight broad classifications. That is quite a problematic area because the, the behaviors are blurry. They quite often overlap. But we can see here eight broad classifications. So we've got 
top left bad actors so people who misrepresent themselves to qualify for a survey then we've got fraudulent participants so that's um, people or sometimes groups of people that attempt to collect survey rewards sometimes at scale sometimes through multiple accounts then we've got problematic so those might be people using automation tools so there's more and more of those we've got inattentive on the top right you can see the the doodling behavior so people who are disengaged who are perhaps responding without sufficient consideration to the questionnaire we've got mischievous on the bottom left so that's uh, participants who are providing intentionally um, false or misleading information. Sometimes that's through frustration. Um, and one example of that that Deborah drew my attention to was 400,000 people reporting their religion as Jedi in the 2001 British census. So things like that, you know, writing something a little bit mischievous because you're bored or you're frustrated or, or because it's orchestrated in some situations. Then you've got professional participants. And there we have a uh, professional participants who are bad uh, actors, if you like, completes at a higher rate with no regard for validity, validity or quality. Then we've got good completing at a high rate with a good level of quality. And then we've got valid on the bottom right. So people who are attentive, engaged, meeting the requirements. So if you, if you think about all those different things there, we can see that the same groups of people could actually belong in various of these um, groups, depending on their survey experience. So if you think about repetitive, boring questionnaires, people who are resorting te to technology to fill in some part of them, people becoming frustrated with questionnaires, people being mischievous to demonstrate their frustration. And in some way, those behaviours are understandable. So if you serve up a poor experience to a member of the public and they don't react well, is that fraudulent behaviour? And I would argue probably not. And so our task in this work group is perhaps to address some of the root problems, root causes, so that the issues around fraud, and I'd argue those are largely up the top left of these slides, those bad actors and the fraudulent behaviour, and the sense of the, the problematic, the, the middle areas, these can be addressed um, if we serve up and address the right um, behaviours. So there's two things, as well as the 37 questions, or three, three things that we've got um, that will help to do that. One is a programme that we've been running recently to try and develop demographic best practice. And our objective with that project really was to support multi-country work on a global, a global basis and to address known deficiencies that we see um, in demographics. But there's an important aspect of that, which is when you're screening groups of participants or panels to actually ask the demographic once, not twice, or two or three times, or four or five times, and to pass that information through into the survey. So don't ask information on multiple times. Take what you know about the research participant and, and put that into the study. The second thing that we're doing, or at the tool that we've been working to, is to create a kind of framework that will facilitate discussions about the quality of participant experience and the quality of online quantitative questionnaires. So we've got a large and very qualified working group on this topic, and we've, uh, we've had six months of uh, activity on it. And as a consequence of that, we're um, going to launch a framework shortly, which covers these nine areas you can see in these two boxes at the bottom. Um, so you can see the set headings that we're tackling in this work. And the format of the material, it's based on a number of questions or points that can form the basis of an effective discussion between those that are commissioning the study and those that are designing and drafting the questionnaire and responsible for the survey experience could be different people. And if it's self-serve, questions to ask yourself. So some hard questions to ask about the way that you're dealing with participants. And the SMR Congress um, in September uh, 2023, you'll see the launch of these ideas from John Poulston, um, of Kantar, who's co-chairing this group uh, with myself, and some of the working group members that we've been working with, getting into the detail, uh, the nitty-gritty of what we're recommending, why we think it's important. 
And then following that, that the next stage, um, and arguably more difficult, um, is what constitutes a good answer. So this is what we've been working on. So we've got three things here. Um, the, quest, the 37 questions, uh, a well-known uh, currency in the um, online sample area. We have the best practice demographics uh, where we're building that up. And then we've got the questions about questions. So new piece of uh, information to challenge, to discuss and debate, um, to allow to have a, an objective view of current practices and to improve them. And uh, finally, I'd just like to thank the very many collaborators in this work who've given freely of their time and experience. So thank you. Thank you. I think that brings me back to brings you back to me, Melanie Courtright, CEO of the Insights Association, to give you an update on the Insights Association's work stream. Our work stream is actually called the Data Integrity Initiative here in the United States and within the association. The Data Integrity Initiative is led by Cindy Newman, who is on staff here at the Insights Association, and she is our director of research and leading the quality initiative called Data Integrity Initiative. She works with a very large group of, of volunteers, and I actually couldn't even fit all of their names on a slide. So I'd just like to take a moment to thank Cindy for her leadership there, and thank everyone who's participating in a very large work group here at the Insights Association. The work in progress that we have is first about raising awareness. Um, we're doing podcasts, conferences, and webinars. We're having, um, we're having our CRC conference at the end of the, year, November 1st through the 3rd, and we'll be talking about it there and having roundtables. We'll also be um, having some of our association partners here on this call join us for speaking there. Um, and we also did a survey on fraud awareness, its impact, and data quality methods. We'll be sharing more uh, in the Global Data Quality website, which you'll be hearing more about soon uh, on this webinar. Um, and we'll uh, be sharing more about the outcome of that survey on fraud awareness. Awareness, as you might expect, was lower among some of the um, clients and, and even some of the tech side and higher in awareness on some of the agencies and certainly the providers of data. Impact and data quality methods, some surprising findings about what percent of projects are using external validation tools, which are one of the th things in our toolkit. And so we'll be showing you some um, some data on that. We also have a toolkit. Um, my friends on this call have already talked a little bit about the Insights Association's uh, global definitions. Um, there is a toolkit out there available now, but I'm excited to say that we have a refresh global definitions coming out in partnership with the MRS, the Market Research Society, which Deborah's going to tell you more about in just a moment. But we've taken the step of expanding on our basic definitions and giving you context that the MRS has, has contributed greatly with. We also have new web pages to drive more usage and understanding of issues and solutions at the Insights Association's website. And we're exploring statistical and AI solutions for detecting fraud, um, as Deborah will also tell you about. And then at the Insights Association, we're also designing some learning modules. We're going to build some self-paced knowledge about data quality modules. And uh, all of this is a contribution that we're making to global data quality uh, and to this work in progress. So you'll be hearing quite a bit more. If you want to look for the toolkit that currently exists, you can find it at the globaldataquality.org website by clicking on the Insights Association and coming to our website um, at the Insights Association. So I mentioned MRS a couple times. They're doing a lot um, in partnership with SMR, with uh, Insights Association. So now I'm going to pass you off to Deborah Harding at the, at the MRS and let her speak to you about their work stream. Thank you, Melanie. Hello and welcome to this presentation. Um, my name is Deborah Harding. I'm Managing Director of the Market Research Society. Um, and as you know, each um, association is addressing a different aspect of the data quality puzzle. At MRS, we're working with the Association of Market Research Austria, VMO, addressing fraud and bot technology, mobile optimization, and panel supplier data analytics. This project is structured around three pillars of activity. First is internal solutions, harnessing the solutions and understanding within the research sector and surfacing that knowledge for the benefit of the entire profession. 
The second pillar is around external solutions, investigating and leveraging solutions from other sectors and professions which can be brought across into research. And the third is building on what we have, drawing upon existing MRS quality projects and using these to strengthen and build further solutions. So let's look in more detail at the work streams which make up these three pillars. First off, there are the internal solutions, and this project is divided into five work streams. The first is identifying the terms being used to describe bot and Ford technologies and defining these terms to enable the sector to have a common language to describe the challenges we are facing. This project, which has identified over 50 terms so far and is being undertaken jointly by the MRS team of experts working with Melanie's team of experts at the Insights Association. And these terms and definitions will include context to sort of to give um, real meaning and definition to what we mean by these terms to help practitioners to understand what it is we're all talking about and hopefully ensure that we're all talking about the same thing. The terms and definitions guidance will be produced as an online lookup facility to enable practitioners to use this glossary easily. The second project is looking at identifying and classifying the research sector approaches to combat fraud across different modes and methodologies. This compendium of solutions, so far we have nearly 70 different solutions have been identified, are being classified and tagged by issues such as costs, availability, whether staffing is needed, to help practitioners identify the solutions which they can effectively deploy within their business. This resource will be available as a compendium guidance document, but also as a searchable online tool to enable practitioners to cut particular techniques as they are needed. A separate project group is identifying the legal and GDPR issues linked to each of these internal solutions and techniques. Um, because what we don't want to do is create new legislative problems by inappropriately deploying data solutions to combat fraud. There's no point in solving one problem and creating another one. Another project team is compiling a list of the sources of fraud and understanding how it occurs. And the focus of this project is currently is a deep dive audit of some real research projects where high levels of data fraud were discovered and the team are working back through the data to see if they can identify commonalities and identify sources which can then be targeted to, um, to clean up systems to ensure that um, research organizations and practitioners are not subject to, to the same issues from the same sources time and time again. And the final group in this pillar is investigating how technology is disrupting qualitative research. And just in the last week or so, another association, the QRCA, has agreed to join forces with this MRS project to harness international perspective and experiences of how technology is disrupting qualitative research. But of course, the issues with data quality are not just a research sector issue. And it's important that we look at external solutions to help. So this pillar is made up of three work streams. One project group is identifying and classifying external sectors approaches to fraud and how these might be adapted to apply to the research sector. At present, discussions are being held with the finance, academic, retail, advertising, gambling, review sites and also journalism sectors to see the challenges they're facing and what solutions they have identified and created to address these issues. Identifying which of these solutions might be adopted or adapted by the research sector. There's also a group looking at a range of third party um, solutions which already exist. Um, and uh, these are being documented and classified so that um, different third party sol um, quality solutions can be um, sifted through so practitioners can see which ones might be suitable for the kind of problems they're having. So does it, do techniques have digital fingerprinting software? Are they, do they do copy and paste checks? Do they do AI generated content checks and so on? Um, so again, a very useful resource for practitioners will be produced from that. And the final strand is investigating the possibilities for developing new solutions to combat fraud. When everything else is being brought together, where are the gaps and can these be filled with creating new solutions? It is also important 
to recognise the um, MRS projects that were already in place looking at the quality issues and to leverage these further. So the MRS mobile optimization project, which started over five years ago as a collaboration between MRS and Dynata, Kantar, Synth and Lucid, and Luna, addresses the impact of poor mobile research design and the lack of mobile optimization. Each year, a new wave of research has been completed, which ag aggregates the response data that starts and completes across 13 markets, assessing response differences across gen gender and age, and also to identify the different trends that are um, within those markets, sexes, groups, and also genders. And this has been in, supplemented with a participant satisfaction research project across three of the markets to gain a greater understanding of participant behavior and the effect of poor mobile optimization design. As a result of this project, MRS has developed best practice for mobile optimization, which is supported by the Insights Association and also the Research Society. And we're using this research data to help to inform the data quality project and the research and guidance is already being used by SMR as part of its evidence for the participant experience project. So how are we getting along? Well, the focus in 2023 is to help practitioners help themselves. The outputs we're aiming to issue by the end of this year include the new IA and MRS terms and definitions, which both Melly and I have both talked about, the new MRS guidance on sector solutions to combat fraud, across modes and methodologies, including the legal GDPR implications where appropriate, and a new MRS report on how technology is disrupting qualitative research, and also the new wave of the mobile optimization research for 2023. For 2024, the focus will be outputs from the Sources of Fraud project, the external solutions, and the assessment of third-party software solutions. I think the important point to note is that these outputs will be constantly updated to address new developments, new challenges, new solutions as they arise. Because as we know, the world is a very fast moving place and these issues do not stand still. None of this would be possible without the expert support and hard work of the MRS Data Quality Steering Group. The current group are here on this slide and a big thank you to each and every one of them for their commitment to what is a mammoth task. And now I'm going to hand over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, I am going to click through here just to get to our slides. So I am um, president at SampleCon, and our focus area is around sampling technology codes, benchmarks, and standards. And as we saw at SampleCon this year, and Melanie was part of this, these conversations, the challenge that we are facing as an industry is something that we haven't really faced before. And that erosion of trust and confidence is of utmost importance for us to be able to tackle as a group. And for us on the sampling technology side, it's really focusing around starting with how we distinguish between what fraud is. Um, and so we have four pillars that we are working on. One is building off of what IA and MRS has already started around defining a shared understanding and vocabulary, then a development of shared understanding of measurements and metrics, the establishment of shared standards, and then collaborative solutions. So I'll start with the defining a shared understanding and vocabulary. So as you've heard from both Deborah and Melanie, we have already begun work as an industry with the creation of a glossary um, and the revised version will be launched soon. We are working with our group as well to, to look at what might be added, what other shared vocabulary and common definitions we need to be incorporated. And our target for completing this is September of this year. Following that, we will be focusing on defining a shared under, I'm sorry, Following the first phase, we'll be working on a development of a shared understanding of industry measurements and metrics. So really the goal here is gonna be, how do we gain a clearer understanding of how as an industry we measure fraud and what metrics are needed to communicate this with clients? Um, we are hearing lots of feedback about the challenges that everyone is facing right now on explaining this and are working together to figure out how to set this up and establish a metric system that can be used for sharing outward. And again, the target completion for this is fall of 2020. 
three. In addition, we are looking at what shared standards and measurement evaluation can be put into place. And the hope with this is that we can establish quality related measurements for sample providers to help build trust with buyers. And, and by doing this, it will provide transparency on where we are and, and where the opportunity is. And that's not to say that there is one option or no option. It is really to look at where on the spectrum we will fall and what type of quality you should expect depending on the research you're doing. And then lastly, we're looking at collaborative solutions. So we view the opportunity at hand here with the quality challenge that we face as an industry as truly an opportunity for us to be collaborating together and, and what that will result in in driving more competition in our industry and also fully supporting a thriving market research space. And so we are exploring things like a feedback loop, link security, the creation of an independent evaluation tool and others um, that we can come together and work on as an industry. As mentioned by everyone else, we have an amazing advisory committee and on the screen you'll see the list of everyone who has been working with us tirelessly to get this moving. Um, and there are many others who are joining in as we look to move forward with all of the work that we do. And with that, I will hand this off to Angus. Hi, my name is Angus Hunter. I am CEO of the Research Society in Australia. We are delighted to be involved in this important global initiative to address data quality issues in market and social research. Here in Australia, we've held up our hand to look at the role that incentives may or may not play in impacting data quality. It's an area that's had limited focus on in the past and consequently limited data. When we called out to our community for assistance at the outset of the project, it became clear that it was an area that researchers felt needed greater levels of understanding and consistency of approach. The team that we've put together are eagerly anticipated getting stuck into the project over the next couple of months. So with limited data available on the subject, we are going to go back to grassroots on this. Our team will aim to define what incentives are and the different types of incentive offered to respondents across the globe. They will seek to understand the key advantages and disadvantages in their use with a view to establishing when incentives are most appropriately used. We will then seek to leverage the broader global data quality community to compare the use of incentives in Australia with the rest of the world. Our team will then look to identify the quality issues relating to the use of incentives. For example, do incentives just attract reward seekers? And what are the potential areas for bias when using incentives? And can these lead to more extreme cases of fraud? Also, how will these issues be impacted by the rapid advancement in AI technologies and other similar technologies? And what other issues are there in relation to incentives? We've established a working party of researchers from a wide range of research practices and backgrounds in Australia, including some of the panel providers. The team is being led by Lisa Salas, who is Head of Research at Ovation, and who has recently joined the Research Society as Joint Professional Standards Officer with Jane Gregory, who is also on the Data Quality team. The team are presently defining the scope of the project. However, we intend to initially focus our resources in understanding the use of incentives and their impact on data quality in Australia before we align these findings globally to produce a final report and draft global guidelines on the use of incentives. We shall be kicking off the program at our National Human Insights Conference in Melbourne at the end of August. We have two industry panel discussions around data quality in online panels and the implications of AI on data quality. We're very much in the early stages of this project, but we look forward to working with the rest of the global research community to develop 
and present our findings in this area. Thank you. To bring this initiative together, we have created a global data quality website, uh, which is globaldataquality, or one phrase, dot org. The site comprises a home page which, which features the main news. Currently, this webinar. There is also a separate section which lists all the partners in this project with a brief summary of what each association does and their areas of focus for the project and also the contact for anyone who wishes to get involved. So please do have a look at the different partners projects, the areas of focus and if you do wish to get involved you'll find the contact details there and we'd love to hear from you. There is also a resources section which brings together outputs from the webinars. Um, and the events and the toolkits and all of the various things that we have been talking about today. So this is a really good way of just appraising yourself of what we've produced so far, but also to hear some of the presentations we've already given on this topic, but also to, um, to get, just to get engaged and to, to, to make sure that you're up to date with what is going on. And finally, there is an events page which lists the various conferences and events which are going on um, globally where we're talking about this initiative, but also nationally. Um, and um, so at the moment, we've got featured obviously this webinar, but upcoming, there's also the MRS Data Driven Insights Conference in October and the IA's Corporate Researchers Conference, the CRC Conference, uh, both of which are including sessions about, um, about the Global Data Quality Initiative, as indeed is the SMR Congress, which is coming up very shortly. So please do look out for that to make sure that you are um, finding out about the events that are going on. So if you are interested in, in hearing more and participating in the debate more actively, that you come along to one of those conferences where we're talking about it. And now I'm going to pass over to Rachel. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so the last thing we want to talk about is the global data quality and kind of what the future plans look like. So we have given a small teaser out um, of where each association is working on. Um, but as a whole, you know, the big kind of four categories that we're looking at focusing on moving forward is the development of new resources, both under the individual associations as well as, as jointly as you'll see in, in examples like the glossary that'll be coming out. We are looking at the creation of different GDQ benchmarks, um, as well as additional GDQ webinars. And lastly, as Deborah mentioned, industry events. So our goal is to continue this conversation throughout the year and at, at different events that are going on throughout the industry. And so what you'll find on the website is all of the events that are happening on the, in the industry, and then we'll be highlighting where those conversations will be happening to help you plan. Um, and we're looking at a, the potential of an additional single day event um, this fall that will focus on, on quality as well. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Gabby. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'd also like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers and associations that have come together to undertake such pivotal work. Like Deborah mentioned, if you're interested in delving further into the Global Data Quality Initiative or want to learn more about the organizations involved, you can find additional information on our website. There you'll discover various resources, in, including the ones that were discussed here today. Once again, a big thank you for your time and engagement, and let's keep the momentum going and continue our pursuit of excellence in data quality together. Thank you, everyone. So happy to move into some Q&A now. I, I thank everyone for their contribution so far, and I hope you'll stick around for a, um, a good amount of time that we're going to devote to Q&A. Um, so let me first start, if it's OK, with um, a little bit of a housekeeping question we've already gotten. And really, it's a two-parter. One is, will, the, um, will this recording be made available? Um, and the answer to that is yes, we will be pulling this recording out and we will be making it available on the uh, Global Data Quality website. The second one, which we got, um, and it's a really good one, is will this content that we're all creating be available to everyone and will it be available at cost or behind some sort of member or paywall? 
And we're all aligned that this is such an important initiative that we do not have the intention of putting this behind paywalls or member walls. We want to come together as a as your global body of associations and leaders and make this available to everyone through the Global Data Quality website. If you go there now, you can see that you can go in there, look around and get some materials already. Uh, and there's uh, no requirement for any kind of fees. So um, it, we are supported by our members. So if you're not a member of one of these great associations, it's a great time to think about that because this work is important and that's how we fund this type of activity. But there are no requirements for payment for these. There, It's important to the global landscape that we do this. Uh, and so it's a work of passion. Um, so let me go on to some specific questions. We have some good ones in the chat. Let me um, just start, Judith. Um, I can actually see your picture. So I'm going to start with you. We have one for you. Um, what tangible changes do you anticipate as a consequence of all of this activity? Do, will it really make a difference? That's a very excellent and challenging question, if I may say so. Um, and sort of, I, so as you know, Melanie, I've worked in research agencies for a very long time and sort of recently have got involved in associations. And I think that if the associations can do so much you know they can understand the problems discuss produce documentations point out what uh, they think need need to happen and that sort of thing um at, at some point there has to be a very strong connectivity between what's actually happening in the industry and what it, what the material that we're producing so for example if we take the thing that we've been working on um in the smr work group which is sort of um it, really all about participants, research participants, and the types of questions and experiences that we serve up to them. And sort of, um, we, we've got together this group of excellent researchers who understand the problems because they're dealing with it every day. And we've got this document out for consultation at the moment, we're just about to launch it. So it comes in the form of a series of questions. If you're designing questionnaires, or if you're a researcher, you want to use a questionnaire that you ask the person that's designing your questionnaire, these, these questions, you have a discussion. Unless that actually sticks at some point, you know, some change happens as a consequence of that, which might require some quite tough discussions, then sort of these things won't make a difference. So it requires change across the supply chain, challenge and change. And I think that's sort of something that we're going to get onto in our work group, about how we actually become a little bit more strident about these things, how we educate people, how we set up the frameworks for that to happen. So I, I think it's um, I think it's a very challenging thing. I think it's possible um, to do it, but I think it, it, it requires a, a shift from everybody. I think the other thing that's quite difficult is sort of, particularly if you're talking about things like designing questionnaires, is it implies a bit of criticism about what's actually happening at the moment. And that's that's quite hard to deal with. You know, if you're a researcher at a personal level of maybe my questionnaires aren't as sort of as up to date, what's what's going on in the in, with the internet, sort of maybe I'm not progressing and thinking about participants enough. And that requires a little bit of self-criticism and that's quite hard. But I, I think it's fine. I think we should talk about these things. So I think it's possible, but I think it's a very tough challenge. Yeah, and related to that, Joanne um, asked in the chat and in the Q&A, um, the client's mm -hmm. role. Um, so if you look at our, our plans, we're certainly developing um, codes and standards and guides, but we're also going to be um, hosting sessions at SMR Congress, at, at IACRC, at MRS's conference, at, uh, at, you know, at all of the conferences, because we need to have these tough conversations and roundtables, and we need clients to be actively involved. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's no way we can do it without the clients taking a much more um, informed, conversational yeah. approach to this. Um, and, you know, and being willing to uh, hold everyone accountable to making, um, you know, behavioral shifts. Uh, and, and supporting data, I, I, you know, I, I was a member of the uh, provider side for a long time, and I, there's a lot of people who really are really well intentioned and want to do the right things, but they can't do it on their own. The whole yeah. ecosystem has to support each other and, and raise our arms together. So, yeah. um, so we it, we do believe that if we put the power of the 
of the associations behind guidance that everyone takes seriously and begins to hold each other accountable to, we can make a difference and that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah, so that's good. Why don't I uh, move to, um, to Rachel? Rachel, there's a question for you. Why is this GDQ initiative, it's a similar question. Why is this GDQ initiative from other prior industry attempts at solving quality? Slightly different, but similar. I, I, you know, I think it's an important question because I think we've all tried to do things on our own over the years. There's been lots of initiatives around quality. I think this time, the fact that there's an industry, that everyone in the industry is facing this challenge and that there's just an understanding that we're stronger together. And so the combination of the global associations partnering together and it, global industry leadership buying in to collaborate, I think is going to truly make this different. I also think the fact that we're focusing not on the idea of developing a single solution, but instead how we develop common understanding, establish standards, figure out ways that we can measure um, and educate, I think is going to make it really different. And lastly, I would say that the goal that we all have is momentum and not perfection, right? So we're just trying to keep giving um, outputs so that the industry can continue to evolve and move forward and, and try things, realizing that we're going to have to be living and breathing this for a while. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so a quick question from Jane that I'll, I'll answer really quickly. Are you reaching out to universities, especially faculties that teach marketing research methods and analysis? The answer is, the short answer is yes. Uh, I know in the the, the um, data integrity initiative of the US of IA, we're working with um, some universities to help us model data and model um, uh, some even some AI techniques for identifying fraud. And I know that there are um, universities and practitioners on the, some of the review councils for SMR and for MRS. They're on some of the boards, so they are involved. If you are a university or a faculty and want to get more involved, just go to the Global Data Quality website and pick your work stream and click on mm -hmm. it and send someone an email. But we definitely want as many people, especially, you know, we're, we, we need to stand on the shoulders of giants who have solved some of this stuff before and who have really excellent um, um, expertise and so if, if you want to get involved we encourage you to do that um, so uh, there is a question here for John um, John from uh, Tabone from uh, the Canadian Council question are there samples we should avoid due to quality concerns John sorry just getting my mic on yeah absolutely yes. um, I think there's two answers to that one certainly um, I would be extremely cautious of using samples provided by companies that are not members of the leading research associations in the world, including the ones involved with the GDQ initiatives and that don't clearly comply with industry standards. Um, I suspect most of those on the call are already um, aware of that and, and hopefully avoiding um, those types of uh, sample sources. Um, I think beyond that, I would certainly encourage the discussion with panel suppliers to really understand the sample. Um, I do get a lot of calls from end clients and you know they they often are just looking for the cheapest sample not really putting a lot of um, you know a lot of thought into where the sample is coming from and I think there really is um, great value in, in having that conversation um, to make sure that the sample is in fact fit for the purpose that they're, they're looking at. Um, so I really do think it needs to be a key part of the of, of the design of a research project. I think it's tempting sometimes just to go with the lowest cost option, and sometimes that might be a good option. Other times, um, I think by based on you know getting a better understanding of the sample, they, they might learn that another option might be a better fit for that specific purpose of the research. That's great. Thank you. Um, so. Deborah, a good one for you. Um, could ISO 20252 be part of the solution to the current data quality challenges? And if so, how can our activities be fed into the ISO standard? Um, yeah, I certainly believe it. it the, the ISO standard is part of the solution. It's, it's as with all of these sorts of things, it, it, it's, um, it's, it's part of the jigsaw puzzle, but it's not the entire puzzle. Um, Already, the ISO 2252 standard has a um, annex which is devoted to um, samples and access panels, and um, and within that there are some quality requirements and um, some checks to do with um, checking the quality of participants. Although it's nowhere near as comprehensive as it could be, um, and um, 
the I think one of the important things about it is that the ISO standard it has to be reviewed every five years. And so so the um, 2252 standard, which was last published in 2019, is due for review in 2024. Um, I am not a betting woman, um, but I will say that um, I think it is 95 percent likely that the um, the when the international community come together to discuss the standard that they we will agree that it need it will need an update because it, it you know we, we could decide not to do one but i i genuinely think that they that everyone will say that it does um not least to address other issues like ai and and, and so on as well um so that provides us a great opportunity to feed into the the quality standard the kinds of all of the kinds of work that we're doing across across all of the associations and the the double good news is that um there are lots of people who are, are directly involved in this initiative who are also directly involved in the update to the iso standard um i'm i am judith is yakim is and also melanie some of your team juliana from the insights associations also included and and there are others so there are lots of people who know a lot about this project who will also be involved in the update to ISO 2252. So I think it creates um, a really got a good opportunity to produce just another part of the puzzle to help us to solve these challenges. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So um, Brian and Brett had a similar question. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, pose it and then I'll give a brief answer and then others can chime in as well. Um, they're both asking about legal, legislative or regulative uh, regulatory advocacy as a part of the initiative. Um, and then Brett's was specific, or is there an effort to understand who's behind the fraud? So I can tell you that the Insights Association is actively advocating um, in the federal regulatory area, um, where we're talking with um, SEC, Fair Trade Commission, uh, uh, Fair, Fair Trade Commission, um, Financial Crimes Divisions. Um, it's difficult to raise this to the level of that, uh, but we continue to advocate pretty hard. We're also working with the platforms themselves that, uh, that some of the um, farms and, and even some of the people who teach uh, were, and to have them deplatformed and demonetized. And the, the, um, the Data Integrity Initiative at the Insights Association is working very hard. We don't share a lot about that because one of the other comments here in the chat was um, we have to be careful how much we expose uh, because, you know, we don't want to um, to tip our hand too much and, and actually work to train fraudsters as opposed to prevent fraud. Um, but so we're, we are working, and I know some of the other... Um, some of the other associations are as well. Um, Deborah, I think you had some thoughts in this area. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, um, we're also uh, the, the one of our work streams is looking at the sources of fraud. And as I say, we're doing the deep dive work that we're, um, and identifying, working our way back and trying to identify those that are, are particularly um, active in this area. I think that the challenge we have, and this may be more of a UK specific issue, but is that to engage, um, to engage uh, things like um, the police to take action, um, that you have to be get going as over a certain threshold in terms of the level of fraud. And the same goes also for things like um, the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the um, our regulator who's responsible for looking at things like um, financial scams that involve data. Um, so, and, and tr unfortunately, the, uh, some of the kind of people that are involved in this area are quite adept. They know these thresholds that have to be reached before something will be tipped into an inquiry stage. And so they get to they get to the point where they exploit the market just to a certain extent. They close everything down and then they just sort of re-emerge re Phoenix-like as, an, as another new brand and, and new a new site and all the rest of it. So we are having to play quite a lot of, of catch up. With the with quite sophisticated um, uh, criminal ga gangs at the end of the day, so it it it, it you know th there is is quite complex, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing it. But I think we've also got to to recognise the fact that um, we're not going to be able to do to get everyone. Great. Anyone else want, have anything they want to say on the topic so far before I move on to the next question? No. All right. Well, there is a there are a couple questions. Um, perhaps I'll I'll post this to to Judith um, and maybe John. Um, there are a couple of questions here about um, certification of sample and how the SMR thirty seven is great, um, but um, it, it stops short of sort of enforcement or or certification or auditing and that sort of thing. I wonder if either of you have thoughts on that. I can tell you that the Insights Association, one of our work streams is 
If you look at our work stream, it's language, but it's also measurement. So we are talking and thinking about measurement programs, um, things like audits of the SMR 37, uh, the metric sec se section, or, um, and then there was another comment here about a pledge, perhaps getting uh, members to, to sign a pledge to adhere to these or even make them conditions of membership. Um, so we're talking about that. It's a, it would definitely be a culture shift and would uh, require companies to really come on board, which I think is, is really crucial. Um, and especially with putting, again, the weight of the associations behind the recommendations, we're hoping that this creates a new environment of, um, of adherence and of uh, measurement and of uh, checking to make sure that they're, the, the work is actually being done as they say it's being done. So we're working on that. We, we don't have solutions um, outlined or in mind yet. ISO 20252 does do certification and auditing. And so, again, maybe that can be brought in. Maybe there's an ISO light just for sampling, things like that. We, we would need to look at that. So, um, but Judith, anything you, you want to add there or Deborah, of course? I, I think we can move in that direction. So let's take the 37 questions. So when when sort of, um, so, you know, they're good questions to have. And I would argue as a researcher that if you're doing a serious research program, you should go and ask the questions. You know, is your sample fit for purpose is quite a basic thing. You know, or if you're, if you're dealing with procurement of large amounts of sample, you should understand the characteristics of the sample that you're looking for to drive the research programs that you're driving, you know, sort of, so that, so that's a very good point. And sort of, I think people should be bothered to do that, I would say. Um, we added, and Melanie knows because she authored this part, some metrics on the back, you know, and then sort of, uh, so are people supplying you with metrics? I think it's an interesting question. I can see us going further as we go through this project. And that will be complex to do because there's so many sample providers. You know, obviously there's the big ones, um, but sort of there. Are, it, when you start looking at feasibility issues and you start looking at global programs, there are a lot of sample providers. So I think there'll be some practicality issues around that. I think we could move in that direction if there's a demand to do it. Um, we have started publishing the answers to the questions on the on the SMR site, and the GDQ link will guide you through that um, so that's a kind of a first soft step I would say I'm not sure that's an answer to the question but sort of I think it comes back on what people would like to see you know um, is that the kind of confidence that you're looking for in sample is is that the solution you know, to this myriad of issues that we're trying to solve I think I think that that's a discussion yeah, there's even a suggestion in here from Tariq about a GDQ badge, rubber standard, and, and some other similar suggestions in here um, that, that could all be part of our um, long-term planning. Anyone else have anything they want to add there? I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with both both your and, and Judith's comments, Melanie. I think the, the, one single solution, there isn't going to be one single solution. It's going to be lots and lots of different things that that organizations and practitioners will need to be signing up to um, and and what we're trying to do is hire the bar increase the level improve the quality um, it we're not going to be able to, to to whatever we do there will there will always be an element of bad actors there will always be you know bad sample and 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 so on but if we can actually um, reduce the the prevalence of it to to an extent that um, it enables the the um, the supply chain to function much better, then that I think is 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 what we should be aiming to do, and and those or those organisations and individuals that make invest and take the steps to 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 improve and to 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 get to those that higher bar should be recognised. Great, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat too about B2B research um, and are we looking at B2B? Like it seems like maybe some of our language has been more specific to, to consumer. It's a great point. Um, and, and so broadly though, I would say that we're looking at, at um, we're looking at the data quality landscape um, as broadly as we can while realizing that probably the biggest pain point is in online and then 
um, and then both in B2B and fraud. And But a lot of the tools that we're working on will um, will cover even more than just online. For instance, if you think about the, the survey design element that SMR is taking on, the, a lot of the recommendations that are coming out of that could certainly cover uh, things like uh, telephone research even. Um, so we are working. There's, there's today not a B2B specific uh, work stream, though perhaps there should be. Um, and maybe one of the work streams that we need to add is also this legal and um, uh, and uh, and regulatory element of of dealing with fraud. So there's probably a couple more work streams that will come in, and perhaps B2B will be one of them. But we are trying to make our recommendations cover um, the broad data that our profession uh, generates, because our goal as your associations is to um, uh, stabilize and increase the level of trust in the data that's generated by our profession. So that certainly needs to cover more than just consumer sample. Anyone else want to add anything there about B2B specifically? I was just going to say that um, within the MRS um, work streams, particularly um, looking at things like the internal solutions, looking at some of the legal issues of those internal solutions. Um, and also in the terms and definitions project, we've got a number of um, B2B practitioners who specialize in B2B. Um, so we, we are cognizant of it, of making the um, the solutions, terms and definitions and so on as broad as possible. Um, but I do, I, I mean, it is a good point that, you know, there are differences in terms of, in terms of emphasis. Yeah. Rachel, put you on the hot seat a little bit for a minute. There are a number of questions in here that are just about our technical process, right? And how our technical process is part of our ecosystem of trouble. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk for a moment about, um, I mean, I guess the, the question is, are we going to say that we should no longer use routers? I, I, I don't think that our, right, that our um, associations will be in a position to make such broad, you can no longer use router statements. But what we will do is create, uh, is begin to sort of score and test and make recommendations um, and then uh, bring those to the members to adopt and, and, to, and, and to our clients to educate them. What, will you want to talk for a second about that sort of technical ecosystem System and what the sample con work stream is, is doing? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I agree with you. We're not going to come back and say you can't do X, Y, or Z, like whether it's routers or something else. I think that the hope here is that we can find, A, some shared solutions that companies feel comfortable with. So whether it is feedback loops, whether it is um, some type of encryption that we use, that there are tools that that I would almost say are low hanging fruit that might at least at this moment in time start to help tackle some of the the fraud that we're seeing. But I think big picture, the hope is to look at what we currently use, what we could be using, and then start to make recommendations of of what those standards might look like and, and where we hope that people will start to move towards. That's great. Anyone else want to give a thought on that before I move on? Great. So, um, Joy, you said we, we are focused on data quality greatly and have our own learnings along the way. Uh, can we share that with this group? We would love that. So um, if there is a particular area where you have anyone on this call has uh, research or, or learnings or expertise, if you will go to the Global Data Quality website and find the work stream that most aligns with that work, with that research, and then reach out. We would love to have that content. We'll do content reviews. We'll consider it. And if it's something that you really even want us to maybe consider incorporating some of the findings into the documents, that's great. And even if you want to get involved in the work streams, um, happy happy to do that. Um, uh, so it, uh, let's see here. Um, so there's a question here about uh, are you working with fraud detection firms to measure their estimate of fraud on a regular basis. I can tell you on the um, USDII uh, front um, that we are working with, um, with our fraud detection firms. 
And we're also working with the panel companies, both with the fraud detection firms who measure fraud, but some of the panel companies have their own fraud detection. So we're, um, the Insights Association, in partnership with the, with the others on this call, has a very strong desire to set some benchmarks, because there's another question in here about what's the true level of actual fraud? What's the true level of actual removals uh, for data quality other than fraud? Uh, what, you know, what's the abandon rate? Do, you know, what's the average LOI? So we are actually, we have an initiative under way to create some some benchmarks from data both from the uh, fraud detection firms and from the panel companies and even from some of the agencies who have um, really good uh, data so there is a desire to set benchmarks and then someone here said how will you uh, measure success in a in an ideal world we set these benchmarks and then we watch them move as we all adopt the standards right so we know that we need to be data driven we're a data driven profession um, our goal is to set benchmarks uh, and then to watch those benchmarks move as we as we progress similar to the work that deborah and mrs have done in their mobile they've watched metrics move over the past five years and those metrics have moved as people adopt the recommendation. So that's the ideal ideal outcome here, is that we all come together, we create these tools, we present them, we get you involved, we talk about them at every conference, uh, and then we watch the metrics move. Anyone else want to sort of have a comment on that sort of, you know, the ideal outcome of these? And, and then certainly the, I mean, Deborah, you guys are leading the fraud detection firm stuff, so you want to speak? Yeah, I mean, I... I... Basically, I would I could totally agree with what you've just said, Melanie, which is that uh, that actually the important thing, I think, is to, to build up the evidence base to set them to set the benchmark metrics and then to 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 do the testing year on year to then actually see how things are moving, um, what's working, what's not working and so on. Um, but I think that is the, that is the only way that we can we can do this. Great. Well, we're, um, we got maybe time for just another question or two, and then we're going to need to do some wrap up. And I thank you all for hanging out so long. It's a great group and there are a lot of questions. And let me just say that the questions that we don't get to today, we're going to pull them out. We're going to write um, responses to them and we're going to make them available on the GDQ website as well. So um, there are just too many questions to get to, but uh, we want you to keep putting them in there because even if we don't get to them, we'll, we'll respond um, in a, you know separately. Um, so uh, one of the things, uh, uh, last sort of um, quite trends I see, other than the really specific questions, is around incentives um, and how are we thinking about incentives and uh, how can we expect people to be engaged for 50 cents? So, you know, um, I don't have anyone on this call for the Q&A section specific from the, the Research Society just did a timing of, of, of where they live in our world. Um, but what I can tell you is that they are thinking about incentives very broadly. First, they're thinking about just to use or not to use incentives. And then they're thinking about what kind of incentives, but they're also thinking how to engage people for more than just incentives. And they're thinking about the language of incentives so, um, and they're thinking about B2B versus B2C incentives. So they're thinking very broadly about incentives. It's an area that hasn't had a lot of work done in a, in a while. So um, they're going to be looking at the, you know, the incentives and, and even doing some testing on incentives and what level of incentive is right. In an earlier um, uh, conversation I had, someone asked about in, in incentives compared to inflation and inflation uh, is incentives not keeping up with inflation. And so th they're also thinking about that. But you know, incentives are one tool in our tool bag, and so we need to get them right, but we also need to get the experience right. Uh, and and we, the incentive needs to be right for the level of burden. Another question in the chat about the level of burden. Um, are we thinking about uh, the level of burden that we're asking and, and incentives and experience need to be different for different kinds of research? The answer is yes. Um, so uh, let me stop talking for a second though and, and pass a question over. Um, so any thoughts on how fraudulent re responses to surveys have changed over the past year, particularly with the onset of chat GPT or other programs? Have you seen directly fraud that is a level above the typical survey bots or speeders from, from years prior? What I'll say is um, we're, you know, uh, we're definitely seeing a concern. I, I remember our role is to listen to our members. We're seeing concern from uh, the chat GPT and and chat and AI tools in general are both adding to the research quality issue and perhaps helping to solve some of the research quality issues. They're, they're gonna be a double-edged sword for us. 
So that's part of the initiative, though, at the MRS, correct, is to really begin um, to understand AI tools as well and to begin to classify them and help um, help our members understand, uh, you know, what, what tools they have that are available out there and what they can do. Is that right, Deborah? Yeah, that's right. So um, we, the, the team that are looking sort of at third party solutions, I mean, those, a lot of those solutions are, are, um, have, are based in sort of algorithms and, and machine learning and AI based um, solutions. Um, also, I, I mean, just just in, in terms of some of the work that we have already done, uh, we are getting some feedback that um, in the qualitative sphere, in fact, actually, where um, some of our members um, have are observed that um, things like pre-tasks that are being done before qualitative groups are suddenly have been completed by chat GPT or uh, or some other form of large language model we've also heard things like um, on the on the quantitative side um, that uh, you know open open questions um, uh, open-ended responses and so on are being completed using using these kinds of tools so the answer is yes and as well in terms of the challenges that they are creating they're creating new challenges which are already cascading through into into a wide range of, of, of methodologies and modes Great, thank you. Uh, Judith, there's one here I'm gonna to pass to you. The question is when uh, John made the statement of, of, of perhaps considering using sample providers that are members of our associations. And the question was, do we vet our members? Um, I know the answer for IA and I know it for SMR, but I bet you know them both too. So I'm gonna let you answer that one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know what it is for IA, actually. For, for SMR, we do vet the members and we ask for a recommendation. So if somebody has to uh, recommend that somebody becomes a member. And then, of course, um, sort of, uh, we have the, um, the ICC SMR code. We've talked about ISO a bit. So we ask sort of people to sign up to the code and then we have a disciplinary process, which um, starts with myself and a couple of other members of the Professional Standards Committee. And if people breach the code, then you can go through that disciplinary process. Um, so to so do not too many complaints about sample actually in that process, but we're starting to see some issues around accountability and responsibility for, for research programs, which is quite interesting. So and that's another tool that we have in, in this whole sort of ecosystem. Obviously, it's not a very pleasant tool, but it's something that we do have. Exact same process at Insight Association, including references before a company can join or, or an individual can join and the exact same disciplinary process. If you have concerns about someone's, um, you know, uh, their their work product or their their uh, ethics, you're, you're welcome to use your associations as, uh, you know, as a complaint mechanism. Um, and I, I believe um, for CRIC and for MRS, it's the same. Is that right? It's the same here in Canada, yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's very similar in the UK as well. One thing I would say, which I think is that might be of interest, is also that when we actually are looking at the source of our complaints at the moment, we are getting we are the largest source of complaints that we're receiving are from um, panelists and their experiences of being on panels. So it it is also is it I think it is also that interesting mm -hmm. going going back to thinking about SMR's project and the participant experience as well um, that it. There are there are pressures from all sides. Yep. Well, we're running up against time, so I want to give uh, every everyone on the call, uh, the presenters, a chance to sort of um, say one more thing that they're passionate about, one more thing that's on their mind before we wrap up. Um, and again, um, if you if we didn't get to your question, we will respond uh, separately. Um, but why don't I start with Rachel? Rachel, um, what's on your mind as we wrap up? Is that because I turned my camera on? <laughs> yeah, um, I The biggest thing in my mind is for this to be a true success as an industry, we need to just agree to be collaborative and we need to agree to transparency and information sharing because we are only going to be as good as the data that we have. And so, you know, I hope that seeing all of these associations come together and the leadership, as we've seen today, it's going to give confidence that we can move in that direction to ensure that we really can help overcome this. Great, thank you. John, how about you? 
I think one of the most important things is really for clients to be more actively engaged in discussions on sample. Um, I, I think they're going to prompt the transparency that should be there. It may or may not be there, but I think if they ask for it, um, they will find that it is 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 going to be there, and um, they need to be thinking a little bit more about it. And there is, you know, some people ask, is there you know an exact right approach? And it really is going to depend on you know multiple things: visibility. Um, you know, the, the intention of the research. Um, so they, they do need to have those discussions and I think a scan needs to become part of the research design. And I think that's really gonna bring it to the surface. Um, and and, and um, yeah, yeah, hopefully it'll get more people involved in the discussion and clients are a key part of it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I can't say enough that um, we cannot make the progress that we wanna make if the, clients, if the clients are not actively involved. And, you know, no longer saying, well, we just sort of um, release responsibility for quality to the agencies and the providers. They have to know the trade-offs that they're making based on their buying choices and their LOI choices and their incentive choices. And they really have to be involved. We cannot succeed without active client engagement and client education and client advocacy and client support. So. Agree, agree, agree. <laughs> uh, Judith, you and then Deborah. Yeah, so um, I'd like to make a little plug for our um, uh, almost ready to launch um, document, which is how to improve research participants' experience and enhance data quality. So um, it's out for consultation. So uh, it's been out for a couple of weeks now. You may have seen that. Um, and we're going to have a session at the um, SMR Congress specifically on this and we're going to go into a lot of detail about why it's important um, and uh, what we ex hope will happen as a consequence of it and I'll be joined by uh, John Poulston who you know has written tons of uh, about participant engagement by Cecile Carre, um, by Sandy Casey, Nancy Brigham and Otto Helwig and we're going to tell you about the work we've done um, and then hopefully you'll be able to use it uh, practically uh, as part of this initiative. And uh, just to come back to Justin's uh, question, which is about D a DEI lens in thinking about this, absolutely. So uh, that consideration is, is very much rippled through this document and through the demographic work that we've been doing, which has been confronting um, various outmoded ways of describing people that sort of have been allowed to continue for too long. So. If you have a look at those two, you'll see um, that we have been taking it very uh, seriously. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, thank you. Deborah? Um, my, yes, my, my final message, I think, is, is um, first off, is I think we need to thank all the people that have, have helped us get this far. They've been amazing. Um, and, you know, the, the amount of volunteer time and expertise that has been given has been fantastic. Um, but um, we only know what we know. And there are doubtless people out there who've got other things to contribute. They know things that we don't know. So we definitely want to hear from people. And it's not just a case of joining working groups and things like that responding to consultations like the one that Judith mentioned, you know, just giving us giving us your expertise, we just want to hear from people. Um, and also that we know that this isn't this is a this is a, a sort of uh, a, a kind of hamster wheel, if you like, you know, we will continuously have to go round and round and keep updating and expanding as, as new things ha hit us and, and changes and, uh, 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 and, and also expectations change as well. So, um, there is plenty of scope for lots of input from from the profession. Um, so I just really want to encourage people to to reach out to us. Remember about the the, the globaldataquality.org website, so you can get in contact with partners. Um, you know, check it out for consultations, all of those kinds of things. We'd really want to hear from people, um, and just to thank everyone for for listening to us today. Yeah, thank you all very much. Um, thank you for allowing me to moderate the session. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my last encouragement would be to not grow weary in engaging in the topic. Um, well, this is going to be a journey for us. Uh, we're going to work as a group of associations, all with individual work streams, so we can make rapid progress as quickly as possible and get tools into your hands even this year. Um, but then once those are done, we're going to have to keep going and keep going. This is a journey, a marathon. So don't grow weary and engaging. We're going to need you not just today, but for the long term. Um, and and uh, really engage in those sessions, really engage in the content. And then Joanna, Joanne, you actually asked, uh, you know, for the SMR work that's going to be presented if you're not going to Congress. 
um, will, will you still be able to access it? Yeah, on the Global Data Quality website, we will definitely have the, um, the publication once it's come out of uh, consultation, but also we're working hard to record anything that we present in person and put the recording onto the website. So possible we'll do that as well. And I think Joe, uh, Judith would tell you that that session will also be available in like the SMR Congress live. You can virtually attend. Um, so, um, so SMR, SMR TV. I'm not quite sure what that means, but sort of, um, sort of, Joanne, if you if you um, send me an email, then sort of, I'll I'll uh, get you an answer to that. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to everyone on the call. Thank you to all the attendees. Lots more to come. I couldn't possibly cover it all today, but that's because it's such a big topic. And thank you all very much. I'll pass it back to Angela. Great. Well, thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you uh, so much to all of you, Deborah, Joachim, John, Melanie, Sue, Rachel, um, Gabby, uh, for joining us today. Uh, and of course, to all of you for participating in this web webinar. We really hope you've enjoyed your time with us. Um, I did want to mention that if you're looking to access the website, it is in the console, uh, in the resources widget. So you can just click on it there um, and easily go directly to the website. So from my side, thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you in a future webinar. Bye. Thank you, everyone.